All right. Well, welcome everyone to our On the Pulse series. I am Chris Fortman, the CEO at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, and I am so glad that you all made time to join us. Just a little background before we get started on the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. We are a separate, independent, nonprofit organization, so separate from the Alina Health System, separate from the Minneapolis Heart Institute. This visual kind of gives you an idea that our mission is to improve cardiovascular health through innovative research and education. You can see those in the top circles and with the result being improving clinical practice with those, the dissemination of those research findings. So we have been in existence for um, just over 41 years doing this good work. So what is this work in research and education? We have over 200 active studies touching over 2,000 patients, and half of those studies fall into industry-sponsored clinical trials, allowing medical devices into the clinic um, to help our patients, and the other half of those studies are physician-initiated research. So the most important pressing questions that our physicians feel need to be answered, we have the resources to support that research. Education is a critical part. We have a paid internship program with over 200 alums here at the foundation. Most of those alumni are currently practicing physicians or in medical school. And during the summer, while those students spend their time with us, they are doing real research with our physician mentors and our research staff mentors. And many end up being um, authors on manuscripts and presenting at national conferences. Also in education, we provide a CME and community education and publish over 200 um, peer-reviewed manuscripts annually. And as I mentioned earlier, the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation is a 501c3 independent nonprofit that relies on philanthropic investments that come from community leaders like you. So I want to take a moment to say we are grateful for all of you who make this work possible. Thank you so much. Dr. Nadir Ahmed is a board-certified cardiologist who specializes in echocardiography at the Alina Health Minneapolis Heart Institute. She is board-certified in both echocardiography and cardiac CT. Dr. Hamid graduated from the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, Ireland. She completed her postgraduate degrees with the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and Royal College of Physicians in United Kingdom. She completed her residencies in Dublin and then went on to complete her cardiology fellowship at the National Heart Center, Singapore. She also has research training and completed her Master of Clinical Investigation from the National University of Singapore. She completed her Advanced Echocardiography Fellowship, Interventional Echocardiography Fellowship at Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York. Born in Duluth, Minnesota, Dr. Peter Ekman graduated from Gustavus Adolphus College with a BA in Physics. At the University of Minnesota, he received his MD and completed his residency in Cardiovascular Medicine Fellowship. Following an Advanced Heart Failure and Cardiac Transplantation Fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Ekman joined the University of Minnesota and was promoted to Associate Professor and section head of heart failure in 2014. In 2015, he was recruited to lead the Advanced Heart Failure Program at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. Dr. Ekman has been particularly interested in the role of mechanical circulatory support, such as ventricular assist devices, or VADs, for severe heart failure. He has been an active collaborator and contributor to the literature. He is currently serving as a section editor for Mechanical Circulatory Support for ASAIO Journal and completed a term as the president of the Twin Cities chapter of the American Heart Association. And with that, here are Drs. Hamid and Ekman delivering their On the Pulse presentation. Thanks, Chris, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about heart failure and valve disease. I'm the section head of heart failure and critical care cardiology for the Minneapolis Heart Institute. 
Um, I have a few pertinent disclosures, uh, none of which are uh, directly related to what I'm going to be talking about, other than <clears throat> I do get honoraria from serving on an eligibility review committee for ANCORA, which makes a device that my partner will talk about shortly. <clears throat> Dilated cardiomyopathy refers to a heart that's enlarged and not squeezing well. <clears throat> this becomes important and has a lot of interface with valve disease in that a valve, which is normally, as you'll see on the left, with the, my little red lines there, um, designed to cover the, the opening of this valve uh, when the heart is a normal size. When the heart gets bigger, those leaflets are not big enough to cover the valve orifice, and that can lead to leaking. And so I brought the exact same size to the larger heart. And so the two often go hand in hand. When someone's heart gets enlarged, that can affect valve disease. I gave the example of the mitral valve, for example. <clears throat> when we assess patients with heart failure, um, there's a number of ways we assess for fluid um, retention. Um, a chest x-ray is one example. We can see fluid in the lungs, or we can see fluid around the lungs. Uh, this is one of the ways that we assess this, and this can be seen from valve disease, from a weak heart, or from both. <clears throat> Another way that we assess this is with uh, looking at the veins in someone's neck, and you can sort of see that this vein is distended. And if you watch closely, you can see that the uh, amount of distension changes. And so if your doctor is ever looking at your neck veins, we do that in part to assess what your fluid level is. When we treat heart failure, there are really four main components. The first is managing congestion or fluid retention. The second is medications, which hopefully will help the heart be stronger and limit the impact of valve disease. <clears throat> A third is the possibility of a pacemaker and or a defibrillator. And then there are advanced options such as uh, assist device or transplant. I want to talk a little bit about some of the new developments in this space. The first is uh, what's called subcutaneous diuretics. Often when people are on diuretics or water pills to keep fluid off, um, they don't work well enough and may need to be admitted to the hospital for intravenous diuretics. Uh, we now have a device that um, is kind of like a little patch that you put on that infuses diuretics through your skin, which is one way to uh, <clears throat> remove fluid without being hospitalized. I also want to talk just very briefly about a difference in medications that uh, the treatment of people with a uh, heart that's not squeezing well or a low ejection fraction now consists of four medications. And this is an example of what we call survival curves, where over time, uh, as people unfortunately uh, succumb to this disease, um, the curve goes down. Now, we are obviously all getting older and eventually we'll all um, die, but we try to put that off as long as possible. The yellow, or excuse me, the red curve here is people on what's thought of as conventional heart failure therapy, which is two medications. And the blue line is what we refer to as comprehensive treatment with current group of four medications. You can see here the little black line shows how long until half the people in that group have died. And you can see the green line over to this blue curve. It extends life by an average of almost eight years by being on these four medications. Part of how this works is the heart squeezes better. And another part is that it does help with valve disease. <clears throat> another uh, piece of information that's very new is a trial of over 400 patients uh, who had a heart failure and a normal ejection fraction, meaning their heart was squeezing well but was stiff, and had a body mass index of greater than 30, so were characterized as overweight. <clears throat> they were randomly assigned to an injection of a medication called semaglutide or placebo for a year. Um, you may know this as Ozempic, or Wegovy is another version of this medication. People in this arm had an average of 13% body weight loss, as opposed to 2.6% in the placebo group. And what we found was people could walk farther in six minutes, and they had half as many adverse events. And so this is just a graph showing that people that were treated with this active medication who had heart failure were able to walk farther. Now, I want to talk a little more explicitly about the interface of valve disease and heart failure. There are four valves in the heart, but there's three that cause most of the problems in adults. The aortic valve, which can be narrowed. The mitral valve, uh, most commonly, will be regurgitant or leaking. And the same for the tricuspid valve. 
Um, and again, you can sort of see here tricuspid, aortic, and mitral valves. And you can imagine as the heart gets enlarged or gets stretched out, these valves are more likely to leak. What can be a challenge is that the symptoms of heart failure, namely breathlessness, fatigue, and fluid retention, are very similar to the symptoms of valve disease, um, either because of high pressures or ineffective blood flow. Uh, fatigue due to ineffective blood flow, in a sense, if the valve is leaking, some of that circulation is wasted. I tell people it's like the blood sloshing back and forth. Or if you're in a canoe and it's got a leak and you're trying to bail it out and your bucket has a hole in it, it's not very effective. Fluid retention is a common uh, physical symptom of either valve disease or heart failure, and there's often a lot of overlap. What is not always clear is how much we should spend treating the valve and addressing the valve pr primarily, or if the ventricle, again, if the ventricle is enlarged, that's going to make the valve ineffective, even if the valve is structurally normal. So one of the things that we try very hard to do, and as I think a critical part of treating valve disease, is to evaluate and optimize fluid status from a heart failure perspective uh, regardless. Um, look for anything that might impact function, whether it's coronary artery disease and the need for a stent, uh, rhythm abnormalities, uh, and then we really try hard to get people on maximum medications and then reevaluate the severity of valve disease. In some cases with regurgitant or leaking valve lesions, medications will make that better enough that specific valve treatment is not needed. Um, another option is a transcatheter mitral valve repair, uh, often referred to as a mitral clip. This was from the COAPT study, where patients were, once they were confirmed to be on the optimum constellation of medications, which can take some time, they were randomized to have this valve repaired or not and looked at heart failure hospitalization within two years as the endpoint. The schematic here shows this clip that goes down across the valve, gathers up the leaflets, clips it, and then is removed. And it leaves that clip there that narrows that valve. This is another example of uh, survival. Well, in this case, the upper right is all-cause mortality, showing the people that got the clip lived longer. More importantly, there was a dramatic reduction in heart failure hospitalizations in people who had this clip put in despite optimal heart failure therapy. For the tricuspid valve, it's very similar. We want to optimize fluid status, uh, reduce blood pressure in lungs because that's the afterload. That's what the heart has to pump against. And then in some cases, medications to improve the squeeze of the heart. We see that depending on the severity of leaking in the valve, outcomes are worse. The dotted green curve here on the bottom is for patients that have particularly severe tricuspid regurgitation. And in this case, it didn't matter if there were symptoms or not. Although that's the severe and that's the less than severe group. There's a number of different options for treating tricuspid valve disease, uh, some of which are available in clinical trials. Um, but this is an area of real active investigation. The last thing I want to talk a little bit about is a new device that's designed to influence the nervous system in heart failure. Um, a lot of what we do with our medications is block what are called sympathetic nervous system, which is adrenaline and the fight or flight system. We also have a parasympathetic nervous system, which is kind of the rest and digest system. And blocking the ramp up system is equivalent to ramping up the rest and digest system. And so this is a new device where we place a device, it's a lot like a pacemaker that has a wire going to the carotid artery, which influences how our brain interprets our blood pressure and then helps the heart relax and, and work more effectively. So this is an example of how this device is put in, again, much like a pacemaker and it influences the heart. <clears throat> we don't have um, a lot of data yet on how this could influence heart valve disease, um, but we do expect that if it makes the heart squeeze better and decreases these other symptoms, it's not hard to imagine that it could improve the valve function. Um, in a randomized study of this, we found that people could walk on average 60 meters further in six minutes, which is actually quite far. It's almost 200 feet. Their quality of life scores by questionnaires were better, and they're what we call New York Heart Associational Functional Class, which gives an estimate of their symptom burden was also improved. So between the number of medications, uh, devices like the uh, carotid sinus baroreceptor stimulator. Uh, there's a lot of options that we have for treating people with heart failure and trying to mitigate the impact on valve disease. Thanks for your time. Okay. All right.
Well, thank you so much, Peter. That was a great presentation. My name is Nadira Hame. I'm one of the interventional echocardiographers here uh, at MHI. And I work with, you know, the heart failure doctors and also the interventionists as well doing these procedures. And my main talk will be talking about the procedural part of interventional heart failure. These are my disclosures. And the first topic that I'd like to talk about is the left ventricular restoration for patients who have really poor ejection fraction. What are the options for them? And so the, um, as you can, as Dr. Uh, Peter mentioned that, you know, these patients are opt optimally medical therapy um, with the medication. They have the devices, as Peter mentioned, like a mitral clip or CRT, and they still have symptoms and they rapidly progress and progressively progress uh, decline. And then before they have advanced medical therapy, like an LVAD or Impella, and then they have hospice care. And so we would like to target this group of patients where these patients, their mortality is as high as 25%, their two-year mortality, or even five-year mortality as high as 75%. And the question is, what can we do about these patients before they end up in a palliative care? And so one of the devices is to see whether we can intervene on the left ventricle, as you, Peter mentioned, that these ventricles are dilated. And one of the devices that I've been exposed to for the last couple of years and work on, and our, our center is also part of the clinical trial, is the AccuSynch device. Now, this device, as you can see in the picture, is really to um, reduce the size of the left ventricle. We want to reduce the stress of the left ventricle and hoping that there is some remodeling to try and shrink the left ventricle, not back to normal, but a little better than what it was to help with the function of the heart and overall quality of life of the patient. And so the device has three steps. It's a procedure of at least one to two hours where we gain access, we deliver this device right under the mitral valve, and we cinch the left ventricle, as you can see here. And here is an animation um, that I, um, the, um, we managed to get. And you can see access through the groin, all the way wires and catheters into the uh, left ventricle. And you can see here, uh, trying to maneuver the catheter around the left ventricle right underneath the mitral valve. Now, this you can see here is done not only under fluoroscopy in the cath lab, but also um, inter uh, interventional echocardiographers like me, where we will image and show to the interventionist where to place this. And once the placement of this cinch, you can see we cinch it and try to reduce the left ventricular size and hoping there's some remodeling of these patients. Now, to enroll in this trial, to, to see, we need to make sure with meticulous, you know, um, uh, this um, meticulous analysis of the imaging. And so being brought up to the committee like Peter and the entire team, uh, key opinion leaders in the country, looking at the transthoracic echo. We want to make sure that the heart function is appropriate, not too low, and also the size of the left ventricle, anything more than 55 millimeters with no significant leak of the valve. CT imaging as well, you can see, is very crucial. We look at the access sites, we look at the wall thickness, we also do procedural planning. And you can see here in this image, the wall of the thickness is certainly adequate, more than seven millimeters for the placement of the device. But you compare it to this image, you can see the wall of the left ventricle is really thin, certainly not suitable for the procedure. We look at the excess side as well to ensure there's adequate uh, vasculature for the device. And also in some cases, we do 3D printing model so that we are able to plan, especially this complex procedure. You can see the different catheter shapes to try to maneuver this uh, um, anchors in the left ventricle. So a lot of thought processes and meticulous planning is done before the patient is eligible. So this is a patient of ours that we have performed. You can see that we get access using fluoroscopy around into the left ventricle with the guide wire. We deliver the anchors around underneath the mitral valve using both fluoroscopy and transesophageal echo. And once that is placement, all the anchors, about 13 anchors, you can see the size on the left-hand side in the middle, the shrinking and cinching of the left ventricle to reduce that left ventricle. 
And I'm really honored, you know, we have evaluated in this in the early feasibility studies. And now we are in the pivotal study. And really, I was part of this and presented uh, earlier this year of the, you know, we look at all these patients um, as the exclusion criteria, as mentioned earlier, with regards to the dimension of the ventricle, the ejection fraction, and look at the analysis of the data that we have gathered over the last few years. We gathered this um, analysis with four multiple center um, uh, centers in the world uh, where these patients were enrolled. There were about 51 patients who were enrolled, and we analyzed this data looking at not only at the safety of the device, but also if there's any changes to the left ventricle and, of course, the quality of life of the patient. Does this device work? And looking at the data analysis, these patients are standard of what we see in our clinical practice. They are about 57 years old. A lot of them are male. They have that dilated left ventricle. They have that uh, heart failure symptoms, like what Peter mentioned, of NYHA class 2 or 3. Their echocardiography parameters, their heart function is reduced, their volume and their left ventricle are hugely dilated as well, and no significant mitral regurgitation. In terms of the procedure, all of them went through successfully. It only took about 131 minutes. Obviously, there's a learning curve to it, and these um, the sites are trained on it. We put about 13 anchors, and you can see the reduction of at least 9 millimeters on fluoroscopy. And the results are so promising in the sense that there was an improvement in the volume. And we think is that because of the initial reduction in that change, it you can see the changes in the left ventricle, the changes all the way sustain all the way to 12 months. And that is really promising. And so we are still analyzing the data as to further on in two years or three years, does this change still happen? And this is due to biological effects and all of these are still being analyzed as to how of these uh, effects happen with the device on top of medical therapy. These patients do better in a quality of life. They feel better in terms of NYHA classification as well on top of good medical therapy. And so the results are promising and that we are still analyzing not only the data from before, but in the pivotal trial to really understand this device. And hopefully this will be um, commercial soon, but certainly it's promising advance in terms of heart failure and what we structural heart intervention can do to help improve this patient. And I cannot leave this talk without talking another subgroup of interventional devices, and that will be the interatrial shunts, and you've seen a lot about it. What does it do? And essentially, this shunt is really creating a hole in the heart. And the thought process, there's a lot of work has been done over the last couple of years from uh, you know, animal studies of why we have why we do this procedure is really to relieve the pressure um, in the left ventricle as measured. And so there have been a couple of studies. You can see one of it is the reduced left heart failure trial, the Corvier. We're really um, essentially making a hole between the left and the right ventricle. And you can see these patients actually do better in terms of their filling pressures, in terms of how they feel, in terms of quality of life, 58% uh, reduction feel better. And some of them actually had both in terms of reduction of the filling pressure and do well. And so they continue to do another study, which initially was a negative trial, but actually after which they analyzed the data and showed there is a significant response in a subgroup of patients. So a lot of work is still being done to understand which patient really benefit from creating this hole between the right and left ventricle. Certainly one of the um, key target areas is patients who have preserved ejection fraction, as what Peter mentioned, may benefit from this. And another big pivotal trial, which is currently that we are part of, uh, is the LAY HF trial, is the Alivian system. And you can see from the diagram here what it entails. Again, creating a hole in the interatrial uh, septum, which is, uh, the, which is in between the right and the left ventricle. And so, you know, you can see from the pathological studies creating this hole, um, literally, it's a very small hole, you know, creating that shunt. And you can see the pathological studies here that is essentially a safe procedure. Um, then from the early feasibility studies. 
And now in the pivotal studies, there's about 100 sites in the world, also in the United States and also in Europe and Australia, looking at 700 subjects to see the five-year follow-up and whether these patients do better. These patients do need uh, symptoms of heart failure to be enrolled. Uh, more than 40 years old, their heart function to be more than 40%. Um, sorry, rigorous um, in terms of screening, in terms of their filling pressures, so they're doing an exercise test. And certainly, um, if you have symptoms of heart failure and your heart function is preserved, certainly um, consult us as to what else can be done if you're still symptomatic uh, despite medical therapy. There are certain exclusion criteria to your trials because we want to learn more about this, but certainly what we will look at in terms of your screening as well, your echo, your um, other uh, modality like the exercise uh, test as well. The preliminary data from this Alivian is very promising. Uh, it's simple, safe, technically successful in 100% of the patient, uh, not, you know, and what it showed actually that they, these patients do well in 70% of the patients from their quality of life and also their six-minute walk test. So certainly promising as well, and that's why we are in our pivotal study right now, and these are exciting times. And I'm more proud to be part of the MHI team working together closely with heart failure doctors like Peter and his team and also the interventionists because this is the future of what we can do for patients with heart failure and also structural heart disease as well as so a combination. And I'm part of the imaging team. We look at everything from echo, which is my uh, specialty, together with CT, MRI, and now the future with, air, uh, with artificial intelligence working to help screen these patients better so they get early referral and early diagnosis. It's a hard team approach and our ultimate goal is to make your life feel better and have a good quality of life. With that, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today and we appreciate the questions that have been submitted. Um, first one I have, are there any specific valve diseases or diagnoses that lead to heart failure more often than others? Thank you very much, Peter. That's a great question. I think the most common, I would say, it would be aortic stenosis. I think we see a lot of them uh, in the community. Um, and these patients, you know, we learn so much in terms of their, uh, not only symptoms, but in terms from echocardiography and why they actually have heart failure symptoms. Because it's just not about a valve, like what Peter mentioned. It's about the left ventricle, the entire chamber. And we learn that the aortic valve can not only affect the left chamber, but also the right chamber and has subsequent subsequences just from the tight aortic valve. And so I think Aortic stenosis, definitely for sure, um, being one of the reasons. And I think, you know, other valvular disease that we see in our clinic being the mitral valve as well, uh, because you have a lot of leakiness on the left side, you know, into the uh, pulmonary vasculature. So you have that congestion. And then the third, I you know, is one of my favorite valves, as Peter know, would be the tricuspid. You know, it was the forgotten but is one that we do not speak enough about it today, that we can't get enough about it. And so I think there's a lot, you know, I'm definitely forgetting. The other one that I'm actually proud of as well, being the heart failure that causes heart failure is actually aortic regurgitation. So not only is tight, but it's also leaky. And we see a lot of that as well, and it's really underestimated in uh, ECHO. And we're doing a lot in terms of education. And so my... Um, last words before I pass the mic off is if you feel not right, you feel any heart failure symptoms, just seek medical attention because we'll get the appropriate testing and we'll get hopefully hope, uh, the diagnosis and get the proper treatment. The earlier, the better. Thank you. Um, are you aware of any research linking bicuspid aortic valves to brain aneurysms? That's a great question. Um, I believe that, yes. I mean, I'm not particularly, you know, um, certain which research, but I know there's a linkage that when, you know, there's about 6 to 10% of bicuspid do have the brain aneurysm. And I think the thought process is due to the tissue 
uh, associated with the bicuspid, uh, you know, um, the etiology of it and whether it's associated with the tissues of brain aneurysms being formed. Uh, certainly, you know, it's uh, related and is linked, um, but certainly um, bicuspid can be linked to brain aneurysm. And so I would next uh, talk about a heart failure question to Peter. Um, how about uh, someone with diagnosed valve disease? What precautions can they take in order to prevent heart failure? A lot of it depends on why the valve disease is there in the first place. And we often talk about uh, primary valve disease, where the valve itself is abnormal, either due to uh, aging or deterioration or infection. Um, and then a, the other category we often refer to as secondary valve disease, which often is when the ventricle is the problem or that's enlarged and the valve is leaking on that basis. So if it's a primary valve disease, then I think, you know, working with your doctors and cardiology team to assess. Uh, when is it severe enough that treatment may be needed? Um, and if it is a structural problem where, again, a valve has torn or is leaking or very narrow, um, in many cases, this is something that needs to be treated with uh, catheters or surgery. Um, in other cases, if it's from the ventricle being enlarged, the thing that you can do that's probably most valuable to mitigate your risk of valve disease is to be as aggressive as possible about treating the heart muscle. And often that means many medications, which is never very popular. Um, but it's something that really gives, in many cases, a chance for the heart to shrink, and then the valve won't leak as much. So I think that's what I would say is the best way to prevent this from being a problem. Uh, Nadira, I would ask, what do you think is most exciting in terms of valve research and, and what's most likely to have the biggest impact on patients? That's a great question. Um, I think the greatest impact that we've seen this year has to be the tricuspid valve. I think, you know, in terms of at being the forgotten valve and that the symptoms are, you know, kind of hidden and then until they get to us where these patients are more end stage, I think the awareness over the last two years have been uh, really robust and really game changer. And why I say this year, because obviously the first pivotal trial presented by our colleague, Dr. Paul Saraja, on the Triluminate trial where the tricuspid valve is the first, you know, transcatheter device out there. Um, you know, and there's so much more to learn, you know, because it's just not that one device that we, you know, we see a lot of patients that may not fit for that. And so the replacement therapy. So I'm excited um, of the upcoming conference, actually, uh, in two weeks time uh, at TCT, where we learn more um, on the upcoming trials, on the late breaking trials. So that is one of it. And the other um, uh, research that I'm involved in and I'm really excited about is the aortic regurg. Um, I think there's no specific transcatheter device for the aortic regurg and I'm proud to say there might be one potentially uh, with our presentation at a late breaking in two weeks time. I think it's going to be a game changer. Um, something really um, hopeful for patients who are not surgical candidates. Um, and so these are the Two, I would say the top that I would, you know, right now that I'm really excited about. Um, of course, with my presentation, the interventional heart failure, I think that's exciting times. So Once you see, I think you just returned from HFSA. And I think a lot of what I had seen at HFSA was more, was more directly medical, such as the use of these uh, medications that were initially invented to treat diabetes, but now really seem to be making a, a major impact on uh, the a function of the ventricle, which has an impact on the valve. But I think it's really, we're in an era that's very exciting in terms of these different treatments for, uh, and treatment options for valve disease that don't necessarily require surgery. Um, and that's something that's a daunting prospect under the best of circumstances circumstances and for many people that have either either other medical problems or they've had many, you know, maybe even two surgeries before, um, it often gets to the point that the risk may outweigh the potential benefits. And so having all these catheter-based treatments, it's an exciting time, um, not that we ever want anyone to have heart failure or valve disease, but we have a lot of treatment options that weren't uh, available in the past that are now kind of um, maturing, is I guess how I would put it. That's right. And so next question, um, are there any new medications available for heart failure patients that don't cause additional hypotension? 
So probably the, the one that's getting the most attention lately is the class that are called SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, the two main ones are empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, the, uh, known as Farziga and Jardians. These are the two that have been studied in heart failure. Uh, one of the advantages of these medications is that they don't directly impact the blood pressure in the same way that the other medications that we use do. Um, there's a couple other medications, Ivabradine and Virasiguat, that are less likely to do that as well. Um, but I would say that the SGLT2 inhibitor class is the one that's most exciting in that space. And then the, the, the injectable, uh, what are called GLP-1 receptor antagonists like Ozempic and Wagovi, those also don't affect blood pressure. They can have some gastrointestinal side effects, but are usually very well tolerated. And I guess I would ask you, um, <clears throat> If someone's having symptoms that they think are from valve disease, what, what should their next step be and how do they know when should they go see someone who really focuses on valve disease and when should they find someone who's more of a heart failure specialist? How, how would you advise patients? That's a great question. I think if you have any symptoms, whether it's a heart failure or valve, because it's so interlinked. Um, you know, vice versa, we're not sure who wishes chicken or the egg. But, you know, I think the first thing is, you know, to seek medical advice, certainly with your primary care and certainly with, you know, any appointments with any one of us here at MHI. Um, and certainly the first thing is the diagnosis, getting an echocardiogram. I think to look at the structure of the heart in much details um, in terms of the chamber size, the valvular uh, leakiness, or is it uh, uh, blocked? Um, and But, you know, certainly we have limitations with transthoracic echo. And I think if, uh, you know, being on the surface, and I think we can then evaluate it further with a little bit more invasive, with uh, essentially an echocardiogram or ultrasound through your food pipe, which is a transesophageal echo where we see the images much better and we can quantify the leakiness or the stenosis a little bit better. Um, or other advanced imaging modalities, you know, like my colleagues do the CT or cardiac MRI. But the first steps in the symptoms is really seeking medical help starting the diuretics, you know, to make you feel better and while we work you up as to what is the real problem and what can be done about it. I think that would be the first step. And I think one thing I would add, because I, I would agree that it's more important just to be seen and have that evaluation start and, and echocardiography is usually the hallmark of how we quantify the severity of disease. Um, I, I would encourage people to be open to the possibility that even if someone tells you that you have valve disease, the treatment for that might be pills. Just because you have a leaking valve does not necessarily mean that you need a valve procedure. And in many cases with medications and other adjustments, we can make that valve uh, function better enough that a procedure may not be needed. And we work very closely within our own team to come up with the best treatment plan for individuals of whether we think a procedure would be best or not. And sometimes it's not a question of if, but when. And we want uh, this done sort of when people have the best chance of success and lowest possibility of side effects. Absolutely correct. Um, and Peter, if a patient is diagnosed with valve disease and heart failure, how do you decide which doctor should design and implement the treatment plan? Is this a team decision? Well, very, uh, very often it is. I mean, in some cases, it's very evident. So say, for example, if you have a weak heart and the, the ventricle is very dilated, um, because the chance of this getting better with medications, you can tell I'm the meds guy, um, is pretty high, this may be a circumstance where I would propose, let's see how the medications work for three months or six months, repeat an echo. And if at that point it's not better, that would be a point to involve either a structural specialist or a, a surgeon. Um, in other cases, if the you know there's a tear in a leaflet, pills aren't going to help that. Or you know, aortic stenosis is a good example of something where medications can help with symptoms a little bit, but it's a structural problem. And so, very often, your doctor will be able to help tell you what is the chance of improvement with leaning more heavily on medical therapy, or is this something that's a pure structural problem, and we need to move right to that as a next step. Um, sometimes it's not clear. 
And I want to acknowledge that for some patients it can be frustrating that you see two or three people and we all seem to be pointing at each other saying, no, I think we should do this first and no, I think that should go first. And we have a multidisciplinary valve meeting that meets uh, every week to talk about complex valve patients. And then we also have a multidisciplinary heart failure and structural meeting once a month to talk about patients that have sort of a different angle on, on their problem. So it's something that we really try hard to come up with unified treatment plans for people. Absolutely. I think it's so important, right, Peter, the medical therapy and also that discussion and also the treatment plan and to what's next. So really nicely um, said. And in terms of heart failure research uh, that is currently underway and you coming back from the conference, what excites you most in this time of the heart failure? That's a great question. I mean, I think this is an exciting time to be a heart failure cardiologist and that we do have so many new treatments and modalities and so many things that are that really seem promising. I mean, I think the atrial shunt devices are something that really has a lot of potential for a pool of patients that have been hard to treat. Uh, I think we're seeing a real shift in terms of the types of medications we're using. And on some level, you might think, well, this is weird. Why are you using all these meds invented for diabetes to treat heart disease? But this has been the history of much of cardiology, that medications that were invented for other purposes have uh, been discovered to be of benefit for heart problems as well. So I think we're really seeing a shift to seeing medications that were invented in the endocrine space or for diabetes, that there's a lot of interaction with cardiovascular health and that we're seeing uh, these medications really have benefit uh, beyond uh, treating diabetes and even uh, explicitly in people who do not have diabetes. Uh, but I think the, the number of devices short of things like ventricular assist devices and transplants are also exciting, even though um, that's, it's wonderful if we're able to find someone a new heart and treat them that way. We're also delighted if they don't need it in the first place and having all these other treatments like the Corsinch trial, like the barrow stem device that I talked about earlier. Um, these are some other options of how we might treat people short of these more aggressive options. So I, I think it's a wonderful time to be a heart failure specialist in that there are so many options that we have to help people feel better better and live longer. Uh, I guess I would ask you, what, you know, what, what would you say is most exciting or if you had to pick uh, one angle of research, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the tricuspid valve being forgotten and now we have some treatments. Is there any one technology that's most appealing to you or that uh, you think is going to have the biggest impact? What, you know, what, what, are, what do you have your eye on? Great question. I think, you know, for tricuspid valve, I you know, similar like the mitral and the aortic, there's no one device that fits all. You know, the challenges that you zoom, as you mentioned, because it's a multidisciplinary approach, is that each patient is so different and so complex. And so all the imaging modality that we do for individual patient and trying to find something that fits. And I think that's the excitement right now for the tricuspid. Um, you know, besides the repair, which is the clip, so now the replacement. There's options. there's options, yes, absolutely. There's certainly options, and there's many options. That's the beautiful part about it. As, and then the question is, which one do we choose? Because I think now we are still trying to learn and understand uh, not only the, um, the, the innovation technology part, but also we want to make sure that it's durable that it lasts with and is safe and is good for the patient. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's for the patient. And, you know, we want to make you feel better, do the procedure safely, and obviously improve your quality of life. Um, I always say it's like, you know, it's like my mom's test. So would I place the device in my mom or my family member? Um, and so that's how I, I see it. You know, if I don't believe in a the device, then absolutely not. And I'm sure for you, Peter, too, you know, we need the data, which we are both actively, you know, working really hard with the research, not only in our clinical practice, but also the research practice so that we understand the technology, uh, the complications, and also the profile of the device. Um, so these are exciting times, I think, in terms of the device world. And I think I touch a little bit of um, the artificial intelligence. 
<laughs> so you know me, um, I love that space so much. And I think it's so robust, not only in the heart failure world, but also in the structural world and general cardiology, because we want to see improve in how we detect these patients, you know, before you, you know, before the heart failure symptoms progress. And we want to screen these patients better and provide the best care uh, for these patients. So I think really exciting times. I mean, you know, a lot of companies investing a lot in this space to try and understand, um, you know, the heart failure space, you know, trying to understand how we can diagnose these patients better through our imaging modality. So really a lot upcoming within the year in this space. Do you, and along those lines, do you think, is, is it the early detection that you find aortic, or artificial, I almost said aortic insufficiency, is the early detection the most promising application of artificial intelligence or are there other ways that you expect this to be used more routinely in cardiology practices in the next few years? That's a great question. I think it's it will run into the entire practice where not only in the early detection, screening, early care, but also in terms of follow-up of these patients. And I, you know, love to say I hope, you know, like AI, like chat GPT can help me in my echo report. You know, <laughs> you know, it's I think, you know, we can't ignore it. Uh, but certainly I think, you know, if we can utilize the benefits of it you know, in terms of our processes, of efficiencies, or, you know, in terms of how we improve our workflow, I think that would be a game changer. A lot of work in this process, like, you know, you have companies of how they read echoes as well, automated, um, the probability of a diagnosis. I think it helps with especially our busy echo lab, our e busy clinical practice. I think we should um, use it to benefit to our you know, our workflow processes and efficiencies. I think, um, uh, Peter, what do you think, like we're talking about AI and, you know, in my role as echocardio, how do you feel the role of technology in patients with heart failure, how you treat, and where do you think this technology is headed? I think the biggest opportunity is probably in helping patients, in a sense, manage some of their own care. And so a common problem that we see is people have problems with fluid retention and congestion and uh, often need help or guidance in adjusting their diuretics, also known as water pills. Or, you know, I mentioned that the contemporary therapy for heart failure with a low ejection fraction is now four medications. Um, and getting from low doses of zero medications to high doses of four medications is currently um, very, can be labor intensive for the patients. We don't, you know, want them to have to come to the office every other week and get blood drawn all the time. And so I think there's a lot of interest in how we can use technology to help empower people to, um, in a sense, uh, put together, not just put together the care plan, but implement it so that once we've said, look, here's the goals of these medications and here's where we'd like you to be and here's how you can monitor yourself more actively um, that people can, that who want to be, are able to be more um, intimately engaged in the intensification of their care. Uh, I think, I know there's been work on using um, you know, smartphones and that sort of thing for cardiac rehabilitation and, and other markers. And so I think uh, that's been one of the, you know, silver linings, so to speak, of COVID is that there's been a lot of effort on remote management and remote monitoring and how can we bring that care to where people are. You know, it's it gets cold in Minnesota and nobody wants to drive in the winter. And especially if you live a couple of hours out of town, nobody wants to drive to Minneapolis from far away. And it's potentially dangerous. And so I think it's exciting to see how technology is helping us provide care in the home uh, in a way that's been historically hard to do. Uh, so I think that's a technology that's really exciting. Obviously, there's some, you know, devices and, and treatments that will help individual patients. But on a macro level, I think the ability for us to help provide more care and help empower patients to take care of themselves are trends that we'll see continue. Again, we'd like to thank you for joining us. We appreciate you uh, investing your time with us today, and we're uh, eager to help provide uh, cardiovascular care to you and your friends and family.